Hey everybody, welcome to TCP Talks with Jonathan Baker and Justin Broadley from The Cloud Pod. In this series, we're bringing you interviews with the best and brightest leaders and heroes from the tech and cloud industry. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Daniel. Maybe you want to introduce yourself for all of our listeners. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm a principal developer advocate here at New Relic. And basically, my job is to get developers really excited about observability. So I'm very excited about this conversation because I get to talk to awesome developers and folks that work in the space about observability. So thank you for having me. Yeah, you know, I think one of the big things that people typically get confused about is really the delta between monitoring, which is pretty, you know, pretty standard. It's been around for a long time and observability. And maybe you could expand a little bit on what we mean by observability, and particularly in the New Relic context, um, which is, you know, a very interesting perspective. Yeah, so monitoring uh, is basically when you have your code instrumented with an agent that sends data to a backend. And with that, you get answers to questions that you're already pre-thought of. So let's say, for example, I want to be like, I want to measure how many requests pass through my server. When you instrument your application with a piece of code that sends that piece of data to your backend, you're able to answer that one piece of like one question that you have. Um, with observability, the goal is to monitor your system so that you're able to later ask questions about your system that you may not have thought of when you're first instrumenting your system. So if something new comes up, you can find the root cause without having to go modify your code and then add additional instrumentation to answer that specific question. I think it's interesting from that context because you know if you look at traditional monoliths, um, a lot of the ways that we troubleshooted them in the past was either by reproing an environmental issue in lower environments um, or potentially even creating a hotfix environment and copying it there uh, into that environment. But as you move into the Kubernetes space or you move into more microservices, the ability to do that you know, dramatically drops. <laughs> and it gets much harder to actually troubleshoot as you hand off between these items. Yeah, for sure. There's so many levels of abstraction, right, when we talk about Kubernetes. There, uh, there's virtual machines being involved, there are schedulers, there are just various levels of abstraction and so many different ways that your application can fail. So when you're trying to troubleshoot why my application is slow or parts of my application aren't working, there's so many different levels of things that you have to check to make sure that that's not the issue. So that's where full stack observability really comes into play because with having so much data and information about your system, you're able to quickly figure out and rule out issues that you may be having that's causing the issue. So we have the advantage of the full stack of observability is, is that we bring all the data together in one place uh, so we can correlate events and logs and metrics. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the, the different use cases for logs, metrics, and traces? Yeah, so logs are basically files that record things like events, warnings, errors, things that happen in software. And a lot of logs... Um, hopefully have a lot of contextual information like the timestamp and which user, which piece of software was associated with that particular log. So a log for a web server like might have things like information about like when the server started, like when it like processes a request, how the server responds to those requests, et cetera, et cetera. So it records everything. It's like a history of all of your transactions. But when you just have logs and that's kind of your only source of information about your system, you you miss a lot of like data because logs aren't always like persistent. Because let's say you are running Kubernetes, right? Once you spin up a container and that pod gets killed, that log is gone forever. Like it's not a it's very ephemeral. So you have to kind of like have systems in place for logs that move logs to a central source. So you can like go back to them later. And another issue with logs is that it's just a lot of data and not a lot of it is structured, which means that it's just a lot of text that you have to sift through to find that one needle in a haystack that might be helpful for your debugging. So logs are really good to have as the last step of your observability journey. So it's like as you drill down, you're able to find that one or two log lines that can help you debug. But when you're just having logs to debug your whole system, it gets a little complicated and it's not the most fun developer experience. So that's why we have other sources like metrics and traces that can help you narrow down where to look in your logs 
to ultimately solve your issue. So going into metrics, metrics are measurements that reflect the performance, health, et cetera, of your applications or infrastructure. So you can use metrics to track down like how many, what's the throughput, what is the error rate, how many requests are going through your system, et cetera. And for infrastructure metrics, you can measure things like what is the memory usage or CPU usage of my particular server or VM. And um, metrics are useful because they give you like a bird's eye view of how your systems are doing. It doesn't tell you if, for example, if you have error rate, exactly what the errors are, but it'll tell you, hey, this part of my system is suffering more than average like error rate. You should take a closer look. So metrics are very useful to narrow down where in the system things are going wrong, but it's not the best for actually identifying the exact issue. It's not useful to find the root cause of a problem. So let's say you have a bunch of microservices in your Kubernetes environment. Um, you might have upstream or downstream services that are connected to each of your microservices. And if you see a particular microservice spiking, how do you know it's not the upstream or downstream service that's causing that particular spike? So metrics are useful, but you need other sources of data to kind of correlate it to tell the full story. So that's where traces come in. So traces is basically pieces of data that tracks a request as it goes through your entire system. So it records like how long it takes each part of your system or like a microservice to process that particular request and pass it to the next component or microservice. So traces can identify which parts of the application is the root cause of a particular error. And it can also identify like bottlenecks when you are talking about performance. So if you want to see why a particular request or your part of your system is slow, it can give you a very quick answer on what part of your system is slowing down the entire system? Problem with traces is that it's really expensive. So a lot of companies, including New Relic, resort to sampling, which means that you don't collect every single trace that ever happens in your system because that would cost lots and lots of money. So you do things like head-based sampling where you sample one out of 10, one out of 100, one out of 1,000 traces that happen. So the con with traces is that when we do things like sampling, as we decrease the sampling rate, the likelihood of that trace that we collect having the exact error that we need to pinpoint the root cause of a particular issue gets lower and lower. So it's not the most accurate like uh, source of information if you want to find an issue. If it's a long-standing problem, traces are great for solving those type of issues. So basically, the TLDR is you can use logs, metrics, traces together. And by correlating each piece of information with each other, you can get a full story and the context around performance and errors. So if you want to debug, it's great to have all three. That's an awesome explanation. Do you find people dynamically adjusting their, you know, the percentage of traces that they're recording? You know, so as, as metrics show errors, error rates increase, you could potentially adjust the uh, capture rate of traces to, to try and capture more information. Yeah, that's actually very common. And I see this right after like an emergency, like a lot of people uh, that are customers of New Relic kind of turn to New Relic, I hate to say, but like in times of crisis and emergency. And when that happens, they go on New Relic, they furiously solve the problem. And after that, I tend to see an, an increase in sampling rate. So they get more pieces of data. So in the future, they're able to catch the uh, errors faster. But that's not like a scientific measurement. That's just something I've noticed with customers. So you know, you mentioned the explosion of traces, and that you know reminds me a lot of the explosion in logs, <laughs> which I think kind of goes back to your point about uh, the fact that you know people try to troubleshoot things with more and more logs, and so they keep enabling more logs, which then makes it more difficult. And so tracing kind of solves that issue. But what about the scenario where you are seeing that high volume of logs, and you're seeing those costs, you know, either in S3 storage or GCS storage, or, or potentially even coming into a system like New Relic, who's processing all that data? How do you how do you help customers tackle that problem, especially with some of these economic headwinds we're under? You know, you want to make sure you get the right data at the right time at the right cost, and that's a big theme I think I see in observability. So curious how you think about that. I think a really good practice when we think about like controlling cost is getting a really good idea of how you're actually using the data that you're collecting. Uh, there's this like wild statistic from Honeycomb, which is a competitor of ours, that said that like something like 70 to 80% of the data that they get from customers are not even queried. They're just sitting there in a database. So I think the first thing w what you want to do when you like start collecting large and large amounts of data is really take a close look at 
how your organization is leveraging that data because a lot of logs that I get from Kubernetes clusters just out of the box are useless pieces of information. Like, do you really need to collect gigabytes of data on health check like logs? Like, these don't make sense. So having someone just go through and do a, like an audit, a quick audit of all of the data that you're getting and seeing what percentage of them are useful and disabling those things that are not useful is really helpful because people tend to set it and forget it with New Relic. They kind of set the log settings and they kind of forget about it until there's an emergency. But doing these like quarterly or monthly like audits around how people use data and then trimming the fat accordingly really helps. I guess moving from uh, unstructured to structured logs also helps with, with cost by reducing sort of the, the verbosity of, um, of logs, which used to be very human readable, but now don't need to be. Yeah, unstructured logs actually also uh, are difficult in two ways, right? Like it makes it really difficult to kind of use regex or other kind of things you can to kind of aggregate that data because every single log has a different pattern. And especially with like, uh, as we talk about like logs coming from various different places, right? Like whether it's like external SaaS applications or different parts of Kubernetes, if you have unstructured log, you have to spend extra manpower to actually like turn them into something useful. So I think having structured logs is really, really helpful when we're talking about observability. You know, as you think about the open tracing framework and some of these open standards, how does, you know, how are these different bodies thinking about it? I know like Elastic came out with a competing standard for logs. I know the open tracing framework has a different standard. How, you know, what's, is there someone winning at this point or is it just uh, still kind of a free for all? I think there's a winner in the sense that there's a winning strategy. So the winning strategy from what I've observed in the cloud native space is that backward, like being able to be compatible with as many people as possible is the winner because there are so many projects out there right now that people use in production. Like if you look at Prometheus adoption rates, right, in uh, Kubernetes environments, it's almost like 90%. So if you have an observability framework that you're trying to push that's open source, if it's not compatible with Prometheus out of the box, the likelihood of u- people using this in production is likely to be low. So I think uh, looking at projects that are compatible with other very popular projects and not co- emerging as a competitor, but kind of like working together well is the way forward. So if you look at projects like Fluent Bit or for Logs or Prometheus for Metrics, Open Telemetry is all backwards compatible with all of these platforms and they have very deep and very easy to enable integrations. So if I want to use Open Telemetry as my source of truth, I can hook it up to my existing Prometheus, existing Fluent Bit configurations. So I don't have to spin up new things just to implement Open Telemetry. So I think, yeah, that that's my answer. It's I think be, playing well with others is the winning strategy here. Makes sense. You know, I, I kind of want to go back to talk a little bit about tracing you know, I, this kind of reminded me of people thought of APM as kind of tracing, and and there's some, you know, there's some overlap in some of the concepts. How does, you know, how do we should think about APM now in 2023, you know, versus the APM of yesteryear, you know, which actually New Relic kind of founded <laughs> back in the day. You know, how do we how do we want to think about this? And for people who are new to this, how should they think about it? I don't think that like APM is going away, even though like my marketing partner would probably kill me for saying this. APM is very useful because you want to still understand the performance like of your applications. But I think the future APM is bringing in more concepts of things like tracing and the idea of bringing together different sources of observability data to use correlate them all together so you can get a better view of your entire application's performance. I think that's the future. So it's not like APM is going away or agents are going away. It's just that we're making it easier and easier to correlate different sources of data together. So you have to click and do less manual labor to figure out the root cause of a problem. So let me give you an example. So when you install the new Relic APM agent on like a piece of software, like let's say you have a Java microservice, like without you having to manually enable anything, if you have this Java application talking to another application that has another APM service installed, they will, New Relic will automatically do tracing from application A to application B. So even though it is still an APM agent, it does more advanced things that kind of go in line with what modern observability looks like, if that makes sense. That does make sense to me. And then you think about a new customer coming into a tool like New Relic and really saying, we're going to go down this observability path. 
where do you where do you have them start? You know, you could start in any of three of these, but which one do you think has the most value for a customer kind of thinking day one and how do I get quick to value? Yeah, for sure. I think it's all thinking about like what your goals are. But in terms of like getting value immediately out of the system, I think having installing an infrastructure agent on their infrastructure and installing APM at the same time is very simple, relatively simple things because all you have to do is kind of install the agent, which takes, depending on the language, it can be very quick or it can be a little bit more involved and installing the infrastructure integrations. And the reason I say doing both is because the real power of full stack observability is getting data from different parts of your stack. So you're able to quickly diagnose what part of your entire system is going wrong when you're like trying to figure out the root cause of an issue. So if you have both infrastructure and uh, like an application uh, APM installed, you're able to quickly figure out if something is slow. Is it my Kubernetes cluster that's failing or is it my application that's failing? So being able to do that by itself is really powerful because before you'd have to go manually like SSH into servers or like connect to your Kubernetes cluster and run kube control commands to figure out like what the issue is. But with New Relic, being able to just uh, install those integrations and quickly in the UI, being able to correlate performance issues with issues with part, different parts of your stack, I think that is really, really powerful. What are your thoughts on um, the trend in using machine learning and, and AI in analysis of these observability data? Yeah, I think it's really exciting because the problem that we're trying, New Relic and other competitors are trying to solve is the same. It's basically getting insanely large amounts of machine generated data and trying to make sense of it for engineers, right? And being able to leverage machine learning models and AI to figure out anomalies, for example, in data sets or in metrics or logs or being able to automatically surface up like pieces of information that will be helpful to a user as they're trying to debug an error. That is, I think that this is a really good use of machine learning. And already, like within our platform and our competitors' platforms, we're already leveraging the power of AI to figure out what pieces of data are really important to engineers and when to surface them for the engineer. So uh, that's interesting because you you see a lot of vendors uh, named after fuzzy creatures coming in and saying that you have to you know you have to consolidate all these logs and and you know if you don't eliminate the noise of the logs, uh, you know you don't get true true tone, <laughs> you know in a, in the mess of things. But you know, I, I sort of always had the feeling that you know that's just solving the symptom, <laughs> and really solving the right alerting strategy is is really where it's more important. And I was curious how you think about that uh, with the new Relic One in this space. And you know, how do you think about setting up alerts? How do you define them? And how do you get away from that signal to noise problem that these other vendors uh, try to pitch as the solution to all? Yeah. So something that I've realized in the tenure that I've been working in observability is that when something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Like, uh, <laughs> So a lot of vendors claim that their magical alerting system is going to solve all of your problems and you will never have to touch like alerting again. Like it will automatically generate all your alerts for you. Like these are legit marketing things I've seen. Um, that is not true because every team, every environment is different. And even as AI and ML advances, they're not going to exactly know what your team's needs are. So like, even though AI and ML are great things that give people superpowers to do additional, like, analysis and things like that, it is ultimately up to your team and the people who have, like, knowledge of your code base and the needs of your entire organization to set up alerts. So I think that the alerting strategy is actually building in bandwidth and time in your organization to actually set up alerts and, like, figure out your observability strategy. Because I've seen people try to automate this part of the process. And ultimately, the teams that are the most successful and get a lot of ROI from New Relic are those who invest time into setting it up and making it work for their organization. So I know this is not the sexy answer, but I think for a, for a good alerting strategy, it's just having people, engineers who are going to actually use New Relic, get together in a room and figure out what metrics are important to them. What are the telltale signs that something is going wrong in their system? And then set up alerts and then kind of modify them as like time goes on to better fit their use case. I think historically one of the problems has been that logging 
has always been a, a kind of an infrastructure concern. You know, somebody build, builds a product, you, in, you install it on the server, it gets run, and then an infrastructure ops team is responsible for logging and metrics, and they very often have very little insight into the you know the, the workings of the app, and they have to deduce during times of failures what should we be looking at, what should we be uh, we alerting on, for example. So I think um, one of the things I've really liked to see trending lately is the ability to build dashboards and alerting uh, as code, so that we can actually promote those those metrics and the the, uh, the visibility of those important metrics all the way from the inception of the product, all the way through the, the development lifecycle, to the time that it's in operation. Yeah, observability as code is a trend that I really, really enjoy seeing because it's basically operationalizing observability and building it into the product life cycle, like you said. So like, for example, like right now, you're able to build and distribute dashboards uh, from New Relic through Terraform and Pulumi. So you're able to like build that into your repo. So when you when another team spins up uh, some code that's in your Git repository, they can automatically get built in observability from day one. So that is something that I think is a really good thing that I see teams adopting and really speeds up the adoption of a tool like New Relic because another engineer has kind of already figured out the important metrics uh, and dashboard visualizations that are helpful to figure out how that system is performing. I've been a New Relic customer many times over my career and you know I was thinking about you know, the, you guys were basically done a big relaunch a couple of years ago now with the New Relic One platform for you know a customer who potentially had used New Relic five or six years ago versus today. Maybe you can describe you know how you guys have changed you know the game in a lot of ways. Yeah, so New Relic One was a really exciting launch for us because basically before New Relic One, we had multiple different products that were like siloed. We had like various products like APM, Synthetics as separate product lines. And with New Relic One, we were like, we need a singular observability platform where people are able to correlate various pieces of data and various parts of the platform and stitch them together. So we're able to get more context and engineers have to basically use less clicks to get the data that they need. So that's why New Relic One is so exciting is that it's a singular place that you can go to get all of your data. And the strategy there was we wanted it, the engineers during times of crisis <laughs> uh, especially during times of crisis, to be able to find the information they need as fast as possible. And that means we surface up relevant contextual data when engineers need it. So for example, uh, in our APM experience, if you have our Kubernetes integration installed, as well as our APM experience, you're able to go from application level data directly to infrastructure data. So you're able to see infrastructure metrics side by side with application level metrics. So you're able to see various different types of data in the same view. So you're able to troubleshoot faster. So that's like one of the many innovations that I think New Relic One has brought. Most cloud providers have their own robust logging offerings, whether it's um, you know, Amazon or Google or Azure, they all have their own tools. Um, what would you say are the, the advantages of using you know, a third party solution versus one of the sort of native tools yeah, so I mean, I'm a avid CloudWatch uh, user as well, like on top of New Relic. And CloudWatch is great when you have a smaller application that's not processing millions of logs. Because uh, as data and amounts of data explode in your observability setup, the more kind of uh, the more UI you need to navigate all of that data. And CloudWatch is great for certain applications uh, as well as like other native like vendor provided. Uh, uh, observability tools, but as you get more and more data from various sources, you need a single source of truth to aggregate and display that data for your engineers. And basically, New Relic is a large company whose only focus, this is our entire product, is to help you make sense of all of this data that you're trying to collect. So I think that is the advantage of New Relic. You get this very like large amount of specialized expertise around observability and you get all of these curated experiences around all of these machine-generated data that you're collecting. Do you have any predictions for the future of, of, uh, of logging and observability? I think, like, I am a huge fan of the Open Telemetry project because it's bringing together, uh, in a vendor-neutral way, like, all of the observability offerings that are out there in open source. Because by themselves... These offerings are good, but they're not enough to provide that full stack observability experience. But with OpenTelemetry, it's aiming to be this like single way of collecting various types of 
uh, metrics, traces, and logs from different sources, and be a single source of truth to like uh, send that data to a backend. And I think that is really awesome. And like a lot of observability vendors, including New Relic, are really invested in moving this project forward because that is the future. We're going to be uh, more and more customers are going to be adopting. Uh, open source uh, observability solutions, and we want to be the best vendor to provide support for those customers. Where could interested people go to find out more about observability and um, and your product? Oh yeah, so if you want to learn more about New Relic, go to newrelic.com. And if you want to learn more about like ways you can you use New Relic or uh, interesting use cases, uh, go to newrelic.com/blog, and you can get see a lot of different blogs, including those from yours truly. So, yeah, th- that's where you can check us out. Great. Well, I really appreciate you coming and talking to us about all things observability and, and New Relic, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Visit thecloudpod.net to subscribe to the show, join our Slack channel, or sign up for our weekly newsletter. You can also find information on reaching our audience through a CloudPod sponsorship opportunity. A big thank you to today's guest, and thank you for listening.